Good afternoon, YouTube. How's it hanging? Um, hi, floating mating controls. And I have to turn this up. It's been so long, I've forgotten. La da da. So we're reading the Xiao Fu Kao, the archaeology of knowledge and the discourse on language. Come on, Sheridan, Smith Sheridan, translated by. Did I miss it? Translated from French by A.M. Sheridan Smith, Pantheon Books, New York. I can do that now. 1972. 1969 edition. But this one's from the 1971 edition. The archaeology du savior, savior, savoy, 1969, appendix was published in French under the title, Le Order du Discourse, 1971, English translation. I said that's a appendix. Copyright by Science Information. Rupert Sawyer. Where's the type set, mate? Introduction, part one. The introduction, part two. The discursive regularities. The unities of discourse, discursive formations, the formation of objects of enunciation, enunciations, enunciative modalities. Sorry. I'm too excited. The formation of concepts, the formation of strategies, remarks and consequences. Part three. The statement and the archive, defining the statement, the enunciative function, the description of statements, rarity, exteriority, accumulation, the historical a priori, and the archive, part four. Archaeological description. Archaeology and the history of ideas, the original and the regular, contradictions, the comparative facts, change and transformation, science and knowledge. Conclusion, appendix, the discourse on language. Index. There we go. Part one, introduction. This page was intentionally left partially blank. Introduction. Of course, I haven't got more text done. For many years now, historians have preferred to turn their attention to long periods, as if beneath the shifts and changes of political events, they were trying to reveal the stable, almost indestructible system of checks and balances, the irreversible processes, the constant re adjustments, the underlying tendencies that gather force 
and are then suddenly reversed after centuries of continuity. The movements of accumulation and the slow saturation, the great silent, motionless bases that traditional history has covered with a thick layer of events. The tools that enable historians to carry out this work of analysis are partly inherited and partly of their own making. Models of economic growth, quantitative analysis of market movements, accounts of demographic expansion and contraction, and the study of climate and its long-term changes, the fixing of sociological constants, the description of technological adjustments and their spread and continuity. These tools have enabled workers in the historical field to distinguish various sedimentary strata, linear successions, which for so long had been the object of research, have given way to discoveries of depth from the political mobility at the surface down to the slow movements of material civil civilization. Ever more levels of analysis have been established. Each has its own peculiar discontinuities and patterns. And as one descends to the deepest levels, the rhythms become broader. Beneath the rapidly changing history of governments, wars and famines, there emerge other apparently unmoving histories the history of sea routes, the history of corn or of gold mining, the history of drought and of irrigation, the history of crop rotation, the history of the balance achieved by the human species between hunger and abundance. The old questions of the traditional analysis, what link should be made between disparate events how can a causal succession be established between them? What continuity or overall significance do they possess? Is it possible to define a totality or must one be content with reconstituting connections? Are now being replaced by questions of another type, which strata should be isolated from others? What types of series should be established? What criterion of periodization should be adopted for each of them? What system of relations, hierarchy, dominance, stratification, univocal determination, circular causality may be established between them? What series of series may be established? And in what large scale chronological table may distinct series of events be determined. At about the same time in the disciplines that we call the history of ideas, the history of science, the history of philosophy, the history of thought and the history of literature, can we ignore their specificity for the moment in those disciplines which, despite their names, evade very largely the work and methods of the historian. Attention has been turned, on the contrary, away from vast unities like periods or centuries to the phenomena of rupture, of discontinuity. <coughs> beneath the great continuities of thought, beneath the solid homogeneous manifestations of a single mind or of a collective mentality, beneath the stubborn development of a science striving to exist and to reach completion at the very outset, beneath the persistence of a particular genre, form, discipline or theoretical activity, one is now trying to detect the incidence of interruptions. Diffractive. Interruptions whose status and nature vary considerably there are the epistemological acts and thresholds described by uh, Bacillard, 
they suspend the continuous accumulation of knowledge. There's something in my pocket biting me. Where is this something at There are the epistemological acts and thresholds described by Bacalag. They suspend the continuous accumulation of knowledge, interrupt its slow development, and force it to enter a new time, cut it off from its empirical origin and its original motivations, cleanse it of its imaginary complicities. They direct historical analysis away from the search for silent beginnings and the never-ending tracing back to the original precursors towards the search for a new type of rationality and its various effects. There are the displacements, transformations of concepts, the analysis of G. Gangulheim may serve as models. They show that the history of a concept is not wholly and entirely that of its progressive refinement, its continuously increasing rationality, its abstraction gradient, but that it is but that of its various fields of constitution and validity discourse, that of its successive rules of use, discursive, that of the many theoretical contexts in which it developed and matured genealogy, archaeology. There is the distinction which we also owe to Gangulham between the microscopic and the macroscopic scales of the history of sciences, the sciences, in which events and their consequences are not arranged in the same way. Thus, a discovery, the development of a method the achievements and the failures of the particular scientists do not have the same incidence and cannot be described in the same way at both levels on each of the two levels. Uh, on each of the two levels, a different history is being written. Recurrent redistributions reveal several pasts, several forms of connection, several hierarchies, of importance, several networks of determination, several tel teleologies for one and the same science. That's top. What's that? The explanation of phenomena in terms of the purpose they serve rather than of the cause by which they arise. Uh, for one and the same science, as its present undergoes change, thus historical descriptions are necessarily ordered by the present state of knowledge. They increase with every transformation and never cease, in turn, to break with themselves in the field of mathematics. M. Serres has provided the theory of this phenomenon. There are the architectonic unities of systems of the kind analyzed by M. Geralt. Geralt, Geralt, which are concerned not with the description of cultural influences, traditions, and continuities, but with internal coherences, axioms, deductive connections, and compatibilities. Lastly, the most radical discontinuities are the breaks affected by the work of theoretical transformation, which establishes a science by detaching it from the ideology of its past and by revealing this past as ideology. One. Was that an end note? El Tesor? Four marks. To this should be added 
of course, literary analysis, which now takes as its unity not the spirit or sensibility of a period, nor groups, schools, generations, or moments, nor even the personality of the author in the interplay of his life and her creation, but the particular structure of a given over book or text. Sorry, over re. And the great problem presented by such historical analysis is now how, is not how, continuities are established, how a single pattern is formed and preserved, how for so many difficult successive minds there is a single horizon, what mode of action and what structure, what substructure is implied by the interplay of transmissions, resumptions, disappearances and repetitions, how the origin may extend its sway well beyond itself to that conclusion, but it, mm, that is never given. The problem is no longer of tradition, of tracing a line, but one of division, of limits. It is not, it is no longer one of lasting foundations, but one of transformations that serve as new foundations, the rebuilding of foundations. What one is seeing then is the emergence of a whole field of questions, some of which are already familiar by which this new form of history is trying to develop its own theory. How is one to specify the different concepts that enable us to conceive of discontinuity, threshold, rupture, break, mutation, transformation? By what criteria is one to isolate the unities with which one is dealing? What is a science? What is an ovary? What is a theory? What is a concept? What is a text? How is one to diversify the levels at which one may place oneself, each of which possesses its own divisions and forms of analysis? What is the legitimate level of formalization? What is the interpretation of structural analysis, of attributions of causality, in short, the history of thought, of knowledge, of philosophy, of literature seems to be seeking and discovering more and more discontinuities, whereas history itself appears to be abandoning the eruption of events in favour of stable structures. That's in eruptions, isn't it? Enter something forcefully or suddenly. But we must not take in by be taken in by this apparent interchange. Despite appearances, we must not imagine that certain of the historical disciplines have moved from the continuous to the discontinuous, while others have moved from the tangible mass of discontinuities to the great uninterrupted unities. We must not imagine that in the analysis of politics, institutions or economics, we have become more and more sensitive to overall determinations, which in the analysis of ideas and of knowledge, we are paying more and more attention to the play of difference. We must not imagine that these two great forms of description have crossed without recognizing one another. In fact, the same problems are being posed in either case, but they have provoked opposite effects on the surface. These problems may be summed up in a word, the questioning of the document. Of course, it is obvious enough that ever since a discipline such as history has existed, documents have been used, questioned, and have given rise to questions Scholars have asked not only what these documents meant, but also whether they were telling the truth, 
and by what right they could claim to be doing so, whether they were sincere or deliberately misleading, well-informed or ignorant, authentic or tampered with. But each of these questions and all this critical concern pointed to one and the same end, the reconstitution on the basis of what the documents say and sometimes merely hint at of the past from which they emanate and how has and which has now disappeared far behind them. The document has always, was always treated as the language of a voice since reduced to silence, its fragile but possibly decipherable trace. Now through a mutation that is not of very recent origin, but which is, has still not come to an end, history has altered its position in relation to the document. It has taken as its primary task, not the interpretation of the document, nor the attempt to decide whether it is telling the truth or what is expressive, what its expressive value, what is its expressive value, but to work on it from within and to develop it. <clears throat> History now organises the document, divides it up, distributes it, orders it, arranges it in levels, establishes series, distinguishes between what is relevant and what is not, discovers, discovers elements, defines unities, describes relations. The document then is no longer for history and inert material through which it tries to reconstitute what men have done or said, the events of which only the trace remains. History is now trying to define within the documentary material itself, unities, totalities, series, relations, History must be detached from the image that satisfied it for so long and through which it found its anthropological justification, that of an age-old collective consciousness that made use of material documents to refresh its memory. History is the work expended on material documentation books, texts, accounts, registers, acts, buildings, institutions, laws, techniques, objects, customs, etc. that exists. History is the work expended on material documentation that exists in every time and place in every society either in a spontaneous or in a consciously organized form. The document is not the fortunate tool of a history that is primarily and fundamentally memory. History is one way in which a society recognizes and develops a mass of documentation with which it is, it is inextricably linked. To be brief then, let us say that history in its traditional form undertook to memorize the moment monuments of the past, transform them into documents and lend speech to those traces which in themselves are often not verbal or which say in silence something other than what they actually say. In our time, history is that which transforms documents into monuments. In that area where in the past history deciphered the traces left by men, it now deploys a mass of elements that have to be grouped, made relevant, placed in relation to one another to form totalities. There was a time when archaeology as a discipline devoted to silent monuments, inert traces, objects without content, context, and things left by the past, past, aspired to the condition of history and attained meaning only through the re 
restitution of a historical discourse. It might be said to play on words a little that in our time, history aspires to the condition of archeology, span to the intrinsic description of the monument. This has several consequences. First of all, there is the surface effect already mentioned, the proliferation of discontinuities in the history of ideas and the emergence of long periods in history proper. In fact, in its traditional form, history proper was concerned to define relations of simple causality, of circular determination, of antagonism, of expression uh, between facts. History proper was in its traditional form, history proper was concerned to define relations between facts or dated events, the series being known. It was simple, simply a question of defining the position of each element in relation to the other elements in the series. The problem now is to constitute series, to define the elements proper to each series, to fix its boundaries, to reveal its own specific type of relations, to formulate its laws, and beyond this, to describe the relations between different series, thus constituting series of series or tables. Hence the ever increasing number of strata and the need to distinguish them, the specificity of their time and chronologies. Hence the need to distinguish not only important events with a long chain of consequences and less important ones, but types of events at quite different levels, some very brief, others of average duration, like the development of a particular technique or a scarcity of money and other of others of long-term nature, like a demographic equilibrium or the gradual adjustment of an economy to climate change. Hence the possibility of revealing series with widely spaced intervals formed by rare or repetitive events. The appearance of long periods in the history of today is not a return to the philosophers of history to the great ages of the world or to the periodization dictated by the rise and fall of civilizations. It is the effect of the methodologically concerted development of series. In the history of ideas, of thoughts and of the sciences, the same mutation has brought about the opposite effect it has broken up the long series formed by the progress, progress of consciousness or the teleology of reason or the evolution of human thought. It has questioned the themes of convergence and culmination. It has doubted the possibility of creating totalities. It has led to the individualization of different series, which are juxtaposed to one another, follow one another, overlap and intersect without one being able to reduce them to a linear schema. Thus, in place of the continuous chronology of reason, which was invariably traced back to some inaccessible origin, there have appeared scales that are sometimes very brief, distinct from one another, irreducible to a single law, scales that bear a type of history peculiar, peculiar, peculiar to each one and which cannot be reduced to the general model of a consciousness that acquires, progresses and remembers. Second consequence, the notion of discontinuity assumes a major role in the historical disciplines. For history, 
in its classical form, the discontinuous was both the given and the unthinkable, the raw material of history, which presented itself in the form of dispersed events, decisions, accidents, initiatives, discoveries, the material, which through analysis had to be rearranged, reduced, effaced in order to reveal the continuity of events. Discontinuity was the stigma of temporal dislocation. That it was the historian's task to remove from history. It has now become one of the basic elements of historical analysis. Its role is thresh threefold. First, it constitutes a deliberate operation on the part of the historian and not a quality of the material with which he has to deal, or he must at least as a symptomatic hypothesis, hypothesis distinguish the possible levels of analysis, the methods proper to each, and the periodization that best suits them. Secondly, it is the result of his description and not something that must be eliminated by means of his analysis. For he is trying to discover the limits of a process, the point of inflection of a curve, the inversion of a regulatory movement, the boundaries of an oscillation, the thresholds of a function, the instant at which a circular causality breaks down. Thirdly, it is the concept that the historian's work never ceases to specify. Instead of neglecting it as a uniform indifferent blank between two positive figures, it assumes a specific form and function according to the field and the level to which it is assigned. One does not speak of the same discontinuity when describing an epistemological threshold. <coughs> the point of reflection in a population curve. One does not speak of the same discontinuity when describing an epistemological threshold. The point of reflection in a population curve or the replacement of one technique by another. The notion of this continuity is a paradoxical one because it is both an instrument and an object of research because it divides up the field of which it is the effect because it enables the historian to individualize different domains but can be established only by comparing those domains. And because in the final analysis, perhaps it is not simply a concept present in the discourse of the historian, but something that the historian secretly supposes to be present, on what basis, in fact, could he speak without this discontinuity that offers him history and his own history as an object? One of the most essential features of the new history is probably the displacement of the discontinuous, its transference from the obstacle to the work itself, its integration into the discourse of the historian, where it no longer plays the role of an external condition that must be reduced, but that of a working concept and therefore the inversion of signs by which it is no longer the negative of the historical reading, its underside, its failure, the limit of its power, but the positive element that determines its object and validates its analysis. Third consequence, the theme and the possibility of total history begin to disappear. 
and we see the emergence of something very different that might be called a general history. The project of a total history is one that seeks to reconstitute the overall form of a civilization, the principle, material or spiritual of a society, the significance common to all the phenomenon, phenomena of a period, the law that accounts for their cohesion, what is called metaphorically the face of a period. Such a project is linked to two or three hypotheses. It is supposed suppose that between all the events of a well-defined spatio, space, spatio-temporal area, such a project is linked to two or three hypotheses. It is supposed that between all events of a well-defined spatio-temporal area, between all the phenomena, with which traces have been found, it must be possible to establish a system of homogeneous relations, homogeneous relations, a network of causality that makes it possible to derive each of them, relations of an analogy that show how they symbolize one another or how they all express one and the same central or it is also supposed that one and the same form of historicity operates upon economic structures, social institutions and customs, the inertia of mental attitudes, technological practice, political behaviour, and subjects them all to the same type of transformation Lastly, it is supposed that history itself may be articulated into great units, stages or phases, which contain within themselves their own principle of cohesion. These are the postulates that are challenged by the new history when it speaks of series, divisions, limits, differences of level, shifts, chronological specificities, particular forms of rehandling, possible types of relation. This is not because it is trying to obtain a plural, plurality of histories, juxtaposed and independent of one another, that of the economy beside that of institutions, and beside these two, those of science, religion, and literature, nor is it because it is merely trying to discover between these different histories, coincidences of dates, or analogies of form and meaning. The problem that now presents itself and which defines the task of a general history is to determine what form of relation may be legitimately described between these different series, what vertical system they are capable of forming, what interplay of correlation and dominance exists between them, what may be the effects of shifts, different temporalities and various rehandlings. In what distinct totalities certain elements may figure simultaneously? <laughs> In short, not only what series, but also what series of series, or in other words, what tables it is possible to draw up. A total description draws all phenomena around a single centre, a principle, a meaning, a spirit, a worldview, an overall shape, a general history, on the contrary, would deploy the space of a dispersion. Fourth and last consequence, the new history is confronted by a number of methodological problems, 
several of which no doubt existed long before the emergence of the new history, but which taken together characterize it. These include the building up of coherent and homogeneous corpora of documents, open or closed, exhausted or inexhaustible corpora, the establishment of a principle of choice according to whether one wishes to treat the documentation exhaustively or adopt a sampling method as in statistics or try to determine in advance which are the most representative elements. The definition of a level of analysis and of the relevant elements in the material studied, one may extract numer numeral numerical, numerical indications, references explicit or not to events, institutions, practices, the words used with their grammatical rules and the semantic fields that they indicate, or again, the formal structure of the propositions and the types of connections that unite them. The specification of a method of analysis, the quantitative treatment of data, the breaking down of the material according to a number of assignable features whose correlations are then studied, interpretive decipherment, analysis of frequency and distribution, the delimita delimitation of groups and subgroups that articulate the material, regions, period, unitary processes, the determination of relations that make it possible to characterize a group. These may be numerical or logical relations, functional, causal, or analytical relations, analogical relations, or it may be the relation of the signifier, significant, 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 to the signified, signify. Representationalism, the, the binary. All these problems are now part of the methodological field of history. This field deserves attention and for two reasons, first, because one can see to what extent it has freed itself from what constituted not so long ago the philosophy of history <laughs> and from the questions that it posed on the rationality or telolo telology of historical development, the venue on the relativity of historical knowledge, and on the possibility of discovering or constituting a meaning in the inertia of the past and in the unfinished totality of the present. Tiny bit of coffee left. I have to hang out my washing. I will at the end of the paragraph. Secondly, because it intersects at certain points, problems are that are met with in other fields in linguistics, ethnology economics, literary analysis, and mythology, for example. Certain points, problems that are met in other fields. <laughs> but only under certain conditions. They do not of themselves cover the entire methodological field of history. They occupy only one part of that field, a part that varies in importance with the area and level of analysis, a part from a number of relatively limited cases. They have not been imported from linguistics or ethnology, 
as is often the case today, but they originated in the field of history itself, more particularly in that of economic history. And as a result of the question posed by that discipline, Lastly, in no way do they authorise us to speak of a structuralism of history or at least of an attempt to overcome a conflict or opposition between structure and historical development. It is a long time now since historians uncovered, described and analysed structures without ever having occasion to wonder whether they were not allowing the living, fragile, pulsating history to slip through their fingers. The structure development opposition is relevant neither to the definition of the historical field, nor in all probability to the definition of the structural method. <laughs> And I just have to leave it there. So I'm not going to let you sit there waiting for me to come back from hanging out in the washing. It could be a long time. So I'll uh, finish it this way. Better. <laughs>